I'm solo backpacking Venezuela with a 360 camera. Most of the time, I don't understand what's going on, but I always say yes. Nothing ever starts with a no. But how did I end up in Venezuela to begin with? In order to explain that, I need to start from the beginning. Everyone has something that makes them special, something that they could dedicate their life to and feel fulfilled by. And I'm inspired by people who have figured out what that is for themselves and pursue it no matter the cost. Now, I'm not one of those people. I haven't figured out what mine is. But what I do know is that in order to find it, I need to pursue the moments where I feel the most alive. And for me, those moments are when I'm traveling alone in a country with no plan, getting to know how other people live their life. When I was 23 years old, I told myself that I would one day book a one-way ticket and travel alone to see what I'm really made of. But at the time, I was living in Los Angeles, and life was good. I had good friends, stable work, and I was starting to see somebody. But as that relationship developed, there was a moment where my heart wanted to stay with her, but my gut knew that it wasn't fair to sign up for that relationship knowing that I still had to go travel alone in the future. So six months later, I booked a one-way flight to Belize, and for the next 10 months, I traveled through all of Central America. And once I reached South America, my goal was to travel through Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, and end up in Brazil. The only problem was that during my 10 months of travel, I hadn't met a single traveler who had been to Venezuela, and the Venezuelans I met along the way thought it was a bad idea. People told me not to visit Venezuela. They told me it was too dangerous to visit, that I would get robbed. But most of those people giving me advice had never actually been to Venezuela themselves. It's easy to let what you hear become what you think. But for me, that isn't fair to the people that actually live there. So I packed my bags to go see for myself what Venezuela actually looks like. My original plan was to go for a month, but I ended up staying for six. This is the Venezuela I saw. There are two ways of entering Venezuela from Colombia. You can take the land border and take a bus, but people told me that I could get robbed by gangs and the police. The other option was to fly to Panama and then to Caracas, but I heard many stories of people getting their stuff robbed by immigration officers at the airport. I ended up taking the flight, and the immigration officer actually asked me where his gift was. Now, he didn't end up taking anything, but that set the tone. How many people live in Caracas, roughly? Yeah. Uh, maybe seven million or something. Seven million, and how many yeah. people live in Venezuela? Uh, Thirty millions. Oh, so almost a third live here. Yeah, but many people have left the country. Maybe around eight millions of people. Really? Right now. What is the main reason? Just economic condition? Yeah, the the social, the economics, the politician. Mm. Many people live in the favelas and they have to deal with the the drug dealers, the mm -hmm. the police, the corruption, and everything. And then decided to move on to another country to try mm. to start from zero. 
my brother left the country and now he's living in Chile uh -huh. with his wife and the kids. Mm -hmm. And we have like five years that we cannot go travel to to Chile because they are asking for visa. Uh -huh. And we cannot get the visa uh -huh. as yet and we cannot travel to, to Chile. The taxi driver's personal story reiterated the image of Venezuela I had in my mind, which was based off of what I heard on the news. But the reality is that the news never shows you the full picture. And my goal is to talk to as many people as I can here in Venezuela so I can form my own opinion and by using a 360 camera to document. My hope is that you get to experience in virtual reality what I am able to see with my own eyes. What struck me most about Caracas was how green it is. Within a 10 minute drive, you can go from heavy traffic with motorcycles zipping past you to the vibrant Mount Avila. Venture further up the mountain and you get to Galiban, making you forget the chaos of the city. On Sundays, the local highway called Kotamil gets shut down, creating a social bubble within the city. Before visiting Venezuela, I knew three people. The first was a friend of a friend living in Caracas. The second was a friend of a friend's mother who offered to host me in a city two hours away from Caracas called Valencia. Whenever I visit a new city, the first place I go to is the center of the city. If there's an open market, that's where you'll find me. Often called Centro, it's where I get to feel the pulse of the city. People often ask me if I speak Spanish. My answer is always the same. I speak enough to communicate 50% of the time, and the rest, we just laugh it off. As long as both parties are willing to communicate, you can really talk to anyone. I was looking for a cup of coffee and ended up at the shawarma joint, talking to the owner for half an hour. All I could gather was that he's from Syria and that he's been living in Venezuela for 26 years. He told me life in Venezuela and Syria are both difficult. He doesn't serve coffee, but he poured me a cup of his coffee and gave me some falafel to try. <laughs> I happened to be in Valencia for the local fair. It was sheer chaos. The highlight by far was the boxing matches.
Valencia is divided into different zones, each greatly different in social class and standard of living. I was staying in Parque Valencia, a more working class neighborhood. A few streets over from where I was staying was an area called Invasión. Invasión territories refer to informal settlements or barrios that were created by people who needed a place to live and couldn't find affordable housing in the formal housing market. The formation of invasiones is complex since some of these zones were designated and recognized by the government, but the land was previously owned by private people. These areas are considered dangerous due to the lack of basic needs and security, but the gardener for the street I was staying on lived in the Invasión in Parque Valencia, so one day he agreed to show me around. <laughs> For some reason, the 360 footage I shot in his home all got corrupted, so I'll explain to you what I saw. The home is mostly made of metal sheets and mud, and is separated into two areas, the cooking area and the sleeping quarters. He shares one room with nine of his kids plus his wife. What shocked me the most was a little TV he used to watch foreign movies in his spare time. After sharing a coffee, we watched Piranha 3D together. I made a little video about this day on Instagram, so you can get a little glimpse into what his life looks like. On the ride back, he told me how the police don't enter this area, but instead monitor it using drones. Spending a day in Invasión reminded me of how different living conditions can be from street to street. If you drive 15 minutes up to North Valencia, you feel like you're in a modern city. This got me curious to see what other cities near Valencia look like. So when my host invited me to a small beach town two hours away, I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but what I saw surprised me. <laughs> 